Well, I certainly think that our panel are very... Um, uh, adequately and uh, quite vividly describe the challenges, but also how that they, in, in their companies and their organisations, are actually trying to tackle them. So now it's your opportunity to ask the panel any questions that uh, have arisen from the presentation or, or more generally about the whole skills issue in this sector. So any questions from the audience? Hi, thank you very much. Um, so I work in the community energy sector, which is maybe quite different to some of your, your kind of a lot of the discussion has been about uh, kind of the big organisations and things like that. Um, but we have a similar issue. Uh, we find that a lot of people who work in community energy organisations are um, kind of uh, older and generally white, generally male. Um, and so kind of to connect, the, the, connect this all up, I, I thought I'd ask quite a sort of practical question. Um, we organise a lot of events or are involved with a lot of events and we find that um, particularly the most prominent women um, are often, there are quite a lot of pressure put on them to appear at events to be seen on a panel for example. Um, and so imagine you're organising an event and you're trying to put together a day like we're having today, various panels. Um, you find that you, you, you can't obviously see enough people who are women or from um, black ethnic minority backgrounds uh, or disabled, gay, whatever, uh, what do you actually do in that situation? What would you suggest as to how to get around? If you're trying to put together lots of panels and you just, you can't seem to see enough people because it's that, you've talked a lot about young people, how do you bring people up, but what do you do when you're trying to find people to, to be visually sort of uh, there? Okay. Can I have a go at that? Yeah. Okay, there's an organisation called Northern Power Women run by a lady called Simone Roche. She's based in Leeds, but she covers from the West Coast to the East Coast. I think she's got thousands of women. Yeah. And I would just Twitter her, email her. She has the ladies that you need. If you're looking in the north of England, Simone Roche is your go-to lady to find women of all stages. So she's got, I can't remember the phrase she uses, but they've basically got a younger generation. <coughs> And then they've got the CEO levels, and they've got all in imaginary people in between. So I would go for Simone Roche wholeheartedly. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm a member, you're a member, fabulous organisation. Abby. Yeah, um, there, there are women out there and different ethnicities. There are the right spokespeople out there, and they're as equally qualified to talk on those issues as the usual suspects. And I think people who are putting on events, um, we're all guilty of kind of going to the people who you've seen at an event before and you know they're good value and they can speak well. Um, so you do tend to get the usual suspects keep turning up. But you, you kind of have to put your money where your mouth is. And um, at Energy UK, we introduced a ban on all-male panels a couple of years ago now. Um, we have conferences with kind of 30, 40 speakers throughout the day, and we, there's always a kind of gender balance. And that improves the more you keep doing it as well. Um, there's also, I think it's Renewable UK, who have um, a, a switch list as well, um, and that highlights across the sector um, female spokespeople. But again, that's just talking about gender, and we probably need to make sure we're doing more in other areas too. Normally the best people to go to are women and ethnic minorities that you know, because they they've got their networks, but they're definitely out there. Any other questions? Lady here? And gentlemen, there. thank you, Abby, for being the one in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> and I, thank you for Kirsty as well, because she's doing plenty of work on the on the WAMI. And just the point is, are we doing enough? Because I think that uh, when I joined the industry, the petroleum industry, uh, about 20 years ago, we were already talking about lack of talent and female. And I'm in despair that 20 years on, we're still there. And we're still talking about being in a picture on a poster because you're the poster girl. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have to justify that I'm a female engineer in, or in manufacturing. The female shouldn't be the discriminating factor. And, and when we're talking about that is, I had attended, I don't know how many diversity and inclusion uh, meetings, and with the papers, the brochure saying, we have a, dis dis a, a policy about this. But Basically, what happened is, in fact, some of them are just word that has been put into a paper, but nothing happened. Should we be stronger about it and maybe stop the carrot and go with the stick? Because somehow, it's not working. So what should we do to make it really happen and not to be the token female in some of the panel? Because this is the other issue. You sometimes you're invited because you feel that they have to find somebody to look a bit different. <laughs> we all talked about that before, didn't yeah, we? we? Did. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so Nina. I won't cover that one again. Um, uh, the token female, it, 
it is frustrating. I, I joined Philip 66 um, 18 years ago, and I was the only female on our leadership team. Um, and the testosterone around that table sometimes didn't even see me or hear me when I tried to, to interject. <coughs> and it's changing, but it's at a hellish slow pace. We're now looking... The, the problem is we've got people that are interviewing that are still predominantly white male. All of us have an unconscious bias. We all have a, a leaning, whether we're aware of it or not, to people like us. And so we need to bring it back in. So it's not just getting the poster girls out there or, or the, um, the, the minorities there. We need to start educating the staff we've already got about why diversity is good. That to, to get the solutions to these amazing problems that, that we're tackling now, we need to have a mix around those tables. We need to listen to everybody around there. So it's not just the diversity, it's the inclusion. We don't just want them sat at a table. We want to be able to including, include everybody on it. But there's, there's training that we need to do within our own businesses. And I, you know, I say that quite wholeheartedly. We're, we're doing it now. We're making unconscious bias training. It's part of our leadership training. So people are more aware of it and, and can put steps in and controls to manage it a little better. And, and some proactive controls to be more inclusive when they are thinking of teams. Don't pick the person you always pick because they're like a mini you. Look at the quieter person. Bring somebody in that doesn't normally stand, stand up or put their hand up because quite often they've, they've got some of the best ideas. Same goes for interviewing. Same goes when you're out in schools. You know, include everybody. The people that put their hand up in general are the ones that don't need the help. It's the ones that are quiet on the periphery that we need to be out, outreaching to. Chris. I think it's, um, it's a responsibility for government and it's a responsibility for industry. I think the nuclear industry has taken a good stride forward in negotiating the nuclear sector deal. Part of that deal uh, has a target of 40% of the workforce are women by 20... I have to remind me of this. 20, 20, 30, 2030, I think it is. But it, it, it's quite a... So it's a really tough target to make, actually, because they're currently at about... 14-15%, uh, so they need to be recruiting more than 50% women in. But they are absolutely looking at every initiative, uh, you know, including some of the returners to work and encouraging cohorts um, of women who previously left to come back in. So I think, you know, you, you've got to be quite uh, directive in the approach. I think the same actually under that deal was in with Hinkley Point, was setting targets for apprenticeship numbers. Uh, that's also had an effect of increasing vastly the number of apprentices coming through in that program. So I think it's a combination between willingness, but actually, if you really want it, you've got to direct things and mandate it. So well, the great thing is this panel is so passionate. We, we, everybody <laughs> wants an answer on this <laughs> one. So very quickly. I think, actually, the, the offshore sector deal also had um, a, a quota yeah, there yeah. for a third. Yeah. Um, that's by 2030 as well, so kind of challenging quotas. Um, but I think to your point about the, you know, not just talking about it and, and but actually seeing action, I think obviously having a diversity inclusion strategy within your organisation is great, but I think you need to make sure it's a board priority and you need to make sure you're measuring and monitoring what's actually going on, because as in any organisation you know kind of what gets measured gets done. Um, so I think actually having that scrutiny of what is the change that you're trying to achieve and what's going on um, is really important too. Yeah. Nick? Yeah, I just wanted to echo that really, that I think... You know, I think on the one hand, you know, the, I think we're all clear that, that business as usual isn't going to deliver the change that we want to see on, on equality and diversity. And I think that needs to be taken seriously. I, we can all sit here and say, yes, business as usual isn't good enough. But actually taking that seriously and thinking about how that's going to disrupt, uh, it is going to disrupt the way businesses operate in some ways. But that's going to be a positive change if we follow it through. And, and I mean, we've been talking to Ofgem to sort of pick up on Abby's point about what gets measured gets, uh, takes effect. We've been talking to Ofgem about including our diversity target in the next phase of the price controls for, for the regulated part of, of the energy industry, and that's something that Ofgem is, is, is considering. And I think that would be a positive step forward to see that. I think that is an output that we do need to see measured and, and to see action on. But, yeah. That, I'm, I'm going to move on to another question because I know there are people, the hands are going up. Um, lady at the top there, can you... Can you Oh, Still gentlemen the there, there. Hello, thank Hello. you. Um, it was interesting to hear the panel kind of mention reskilling and upskilling. Um, from my role within an awarding organisation looking at adult education, um, I'm very much interested into how would an adult gain entry into the sector. 
So from maybe outside of the sector, what sort of skills are they going to have to need to gain entry into this area? Okay. Chris. Well, let me, let me start on that one. I think, you know, we look for related skills. But they don't have to be direct. So a good example with uh, the shutdown, the Honda works in Swindon. We're partnering with the Careers Transition Partnership who picked up the contract to help relocate and, uh, that workforce is to identify those skills which are relevant to our industry and then we will help move them into uh, a related industry and provide training grants. And I think that's the issue. You know, if you're going for upskilling, reskilling, and that lifelong learning, there has to be the funding available. And I know a lot of LEPs do a lot of good funding. There are a lot of good initiatives, and the money can be there and found. But you've got to find the related skills, then an organisation willing to produce the bridging training requirement, which makes them relevant to the new industry. Uh, we do that, of course, there are other skills organisations who do that for their sectors as well. Kirsty. So I have an example for you from uh, Siemens Gamesa. So when they were building the blade factory in Hull, they knew that they needed to recruit from the local workforce and they knew that no one knew how to win, build a wind turbine blade. So they worked out how to do the training and they didn't look at what A level the person had or what degree that person had or what. They looked at what their thought processes was, how they interacted with people and they did some basic practical skill training. And then they took that person and trained them in their own training facility. And they've got an amazing workforce. And they tried really hard to get the diversity in there as well. So they've got not just diversity of, of you know, women, men, but age and background. So I think companies actually, if they think about it far enough out, they can plan it in. Can I do, <laughs> and, and absolutely, that's fantastic. The corollary to that and, uh, is, is ensuring that we don't do too much bespoke training that you know, we recognise what are the common core skills and train to that and make those the transferable skills. Because if we want a truly transferable labour force that can flow to meet requirements, we've got to identify what those core elements are and then bespoke the last bit. The danger of going in with absolutely bespoke training courses is you train someone to do that job, smart meter installers, for example, who all know they're going to be redundant in two years' time because, you know, that's when the programme's finished. Then what? One final question from the audience. Hi there, everybody. Just on Chris's point, I would uh, completely agree. We've got a life of jobs now, not a job for life. However, as industry, we're going to have a shortage of over 2 million technical people over the next 10 years. Quotas have been tried before in skills and in diversity. And we've brought in the apprenticeship levy, which seems to be more of a punitive tax rather than actually dealing with the problem. Is it not about time that actually we all got together and the government brought in an act like they have in Germany in the Training Act where 7% of their workforce have to be in training and they have to deal with their diversity issues within that 7%? Anyone like to have a go at that? <laughs> Good question, Brandon. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it, but I, I think we've already got different systems. I, I agree. I mean, there are, there's a lot of validity in their approach. Um, I, I think it comes back to the point. I, I think set, um, setting targets by government helps. Nina, I'm. As a, as a female that, that's been in a fairly male-dominated industry, um, in fact, most of my career I've been in fairly male-dominated industries, I'm probably the one that, that, that sort of steps away from quotas. Um, I know I've been a token female. I know I've been given a job because I'm female, not necessarily because I was the best person for that job. Um, a friend who's an engineer was told after she got a job, she got it because she was female. Now, that's not great. The, the problem needs to get back to schools. For us to get the quotas, we, we're talking back with Kirsty and Wymie, we need to make sure that everybody realises that these jobs are available. And it's not get to the interview stage and, oh, we need to hit a certain percent, because that's wrong. We all need to be recruiting whoever that best person is, whether they male, female, black, white, whatever religion, whatever area of the country, however their education is, they need to be the best person for the job. So we need to get back and show that these jobs are available and they're available for all and get them inspired to apply for them. If they don't apply for them, we can't offer them. 
and we can't just fit a quota and give somebody a job and demoralise them to a certain extent because you're going to be our poster girl or you're going to fit on the front of our diversity brochure. It's a difficult one. Um, well, finally, I'm very conscious of the fact we're five minutes from lunch and, um, and you've, been, um, you've been a very uh, receptive audience. I'd just quickly like the, um, the panel um, to tell me what is the one thing that they would do that they think would make the biggest difference in this skills arena. So I'll start at that end. Ooh. Nick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure what... Uh, that's a tough one to answer. I think what we need to see is a... Is a uh, I think the national retraining scheme is a good step in the right direction. I think we need to see uh, better funding and a, and a more collaborative approach to, to addressing skills between uh, work, the workforce and, and employers. Right, thank you. Abby. Mm -hmm. um, I think know your own organisation, so don't assume you haven't got a diversity and inclusion problem because obviously a lot of issues are unseen as well if it comes to disability. Um, so I think make sure you know your organisation and actually ask them. Okay. Chris? I think it's probably a revitalised vocational education system that, that will produce you know, people who are resilient, have the right attitude and approach to work and have, have got inculcated within them the lifelong learning aspect of that. Um, so I want two ladies to wave their hands at the moment, Jenny and, and Kerry. So they're from the Careers Enterprise Company. Um, I would ask you to look up on their website a thing called Give an Hour. Anybody can do it. You give an hour to a school in your area. They can either come to your business or you can go to them and you tell them for an hour, not, not more, an hour, what it's like to work there. They'd love it. So Career Enterprise Company, Google it, or those two ladies there that waved at you. They work in the Humber, South Bank and North Bank. Go chat to them, they'd love it. Thank you. And finally, Nina. Uh, uh, collaborate. We're all looking at the same problems, the same issues. Let's get together, let's work together and let's sort it. It does seem to me that I have been uh, dealing with this thorny issue for the last 30 years. And as you say, we, we still keep talking about it. I think the one thing you can't deny is the passion that we've had from our panellists today. And obviously that they believe really that we, this is something that we have to tackle. I think it's been really interesting that, that Chris mentioned that it's not just um, our young people, but really it is upskilling and retraining. And that is so important. We need, but we do need to make sure that our young people are passionate about this agenda. So how do we actually, as Abby said, turn that into a positive where they don't see the industry as being the enemy, but the indus industry as being the solution? And because, let's be honest, we've all talked over the last two days about this huge challenge. We can come up with all the solutions, but actually, in the end, we're going to have to have people with the right skills who are going to be able to deliver it, or else we're not going to move this agenda forward at all. So I'd just like to thank the panel. Um, you've been terrific, and hope you enjoy the rest of the day and lunch. So thank you. Thank you.